Now I would like to, uh, to welcome Evan Schwartz, engineer from Ripple. Thank you for having me and do, do, do. All right, so my name is Evan Schwartz. I've been an engineer at Ripple for the past five years since it was a 14 person company. And I'm also the co-inventor of two of the technologies that I'll be talking about today, the Interledger protocol and and Codius. So I'm going to try to very quickly give an overview of the company, some of the technologies that we work with, and the research opportunities that we see. So to start off, uh, Ripple has offices around the world. Uh, some of the investors are, are listed here, and we, it is a global company. We're focused on building a global payments network, so we ha have offices around the world. I'm not the best person to talk about any of these aspects, so I will keep moving. Um, the, this is a quick snapshot of some of, the, some of the customers that we have. So we work with large banks down to very small regional payment providers. Um, and it's all about connecting these together. The company's vision is to enable what we call the, what we refer to as the internet of value, where today it's super easy to move information around the world and it's really painful if you're sending money. We once heard a comment from a, a global banking executive saying that they could FedEx cash faster than they could send wire transfers around the world and with greater certainty. So a lot of Ripple's mission today is focused on removing the friction from global payments. To do this, there's three main products which Ripple offers focused on different customer segments. There's XCurrent, which is focused on larger financial institutions. XRapid, which is about sourcing real-time liquidity for different currencies, and XVIA, which is targeted towards corporates. Again, I'm not the best person to talk about any of these, so I'm going to keep moving. The main benefits that we're trying to offer to our customers are enabling financial institutions to meet the new demands of their customers. So we've heard from a lot of customers that uh, things like marketplaces and tech companies are demanding just faster payments, um, you know, real-time solutions, higher volumes, lower value transactions, and certainty all the way through the process. Ripple's stack is underpinned by three key open source technologies, and this is really what I'm going to talk more about. So the first of these is the XRP ledger, which is a, a blockchain technology that services the primarily the XRP cryptocurrency. And this is a digital asset that is designed specifically for payments use cases. So some of the key facts about this, uh, this is distinct from Ripple the company, though Ripple is a, is a large stakeholder in the ecosystem. This was established in 2012 and has been operating without issue ever since. Um, it has four, three to five second transactions compared with 10 to 60 minutes on something like Bitcoin. It has 1,500 transactions per second on the ledger um, and allows for unlimited payments throughput using off-ledger technology payment channels, which some of you may be familiar with, others not. Um, it has a unique consensus protocol designed for an open validator set, so it does not use mining, which we view as very in inefficient. can talk more about these later if people are interested. Um, and the ledger also includes a built-in exchange so that different assets can be represented on the ledger and exchanged through it. Um, there's an active market for, uh, for XRP on and off the ledger. Um, there's a, a website called XRP Charts, which, which details some of this. Won't talk too much about that. Um, the thing that I can speak much more about, and I'll only give a brief introduction here, but happy to talk at length about this later, is Interledger. So the, the biggest problem, arguably, today in payments is that the payment space is super fragmented. So in every different country, you have different regional payment methods. And if you, go, if you go traveling, there's certain payment methods that work around the world, but many of them do not. 
So one of the problems here is that in order to pay someone, you have to be on the same payment network. If I wanted to pay anyone in this room right now, we would have to have this discussion. Uh, okay, do you have Venmo? No, don't have Venmo. Do you accept Bitcoin? No, don't have Bitcoin. Uh, like, how am I going to actually get money to you? The flip side of this problem is that if you're a merchant wanting to accept payments from lots of different people, you have to accept a ton of different payment methods because some of your customers might want to pay in one of many different payment methods. So this is an actual website and this is the list of payment methods that they accept, which is completely insane. So there's some of the methods, you, some of the payment methods you'll recognize because they're big global ones and many of them are these kind of long tail payment methods that you just kind of need to support just in case someone wants to pay you. You don't want to turn away customers as a result of this. So the fundamental problem here is that all payment networks are disconnected from one another. You have these different kind of payment networks and within different groups, some of them are connected together. So there are banking networks and there's some retail payment methods and there are you know, mobile money networks in certain countries, but all of these are disconnected from one another. So arguably what we need is internetworking for payment networks. And this idea of internetworking is why we call the internet the internet. That's the, the word it comes from. And on the internet, internetworking is really the thing that connects everybody. The reason why I can just plug in and suddenly be connected to everybody else is because it's not about connecting to one network. I'm connected to my internet service provider and you're connected to yours but they're linked through some series of hops and what we call, that's what makes up the internet. So it's really this, this internetworking aspect that connects everybody to the, together. So Interledger is internetworking for money. And I'll explain very briefly what that looks like. The project was started at Ripple and then spun out as a separate open source project. There's contributors from a lot of different backgrounds because it's very use case agnostic. And so we primarily work on it under the aegis of a W3C com uh, community group. So to give you a little bit of a taste of, of how Interledger works or what it looks like under the hood, this is what the internet architecture looked like. This is uh, commonly referred to as the hourglass architecture. And the main point here is that on the bottom layer, you have a lot of different networking technologies. And none of these were designed to work together. You have, this is where you have your Wi-Fi or your Bluetooth, Ethernet, et cetera. And on top of that, you have this very simple internet protocol layer that really just does one thing, which is I have this packet of data over here. Please, could you get this packet over there? And it doesn't say why we're moving this packet or who's moving it. It's just get this packet over there. And what that enables us to do is build a lot of use case specific applications on top of that common infrastructure. And that, that global network is really just optimized for let's send these packets as fast as possible. So this is the Interledger architecture. You may notice some similarities. So the, the bottom layer of the Interledger architecture is the, the ledger layer. This is where financial assets are, are transferred. And so that could be anything ranging from banks to blockchains, mobile money networks, digital wallets, what have you. It's really designed to connect any, any type of ledger. On top of that, you have this very, very simple interledger protocol layer that's just focused on, I have this little packet of money over here, please get it over there. Very similar ideas to the internet. And then on top of that, you have different types of application protocols built for different purposes. So some of the ones listed here, uh, simple payment setup protocol, SPSP. Uh, at some point I built a, a version of a torrent client where you would pay in the stream of a, while torrenting files, et cetera. Lots of different types of use cases. To give you a little sense of the, what the model looks like. So connectors are what we, Connectors are the entities that are routing payment, these payment packets across different networks. And these are very, very much analogous to routers on the internet. In, just like the internet, packets can be sent across any number of hops and, can, and the currencies are exchanged in the flow of the payment. So the experience is I can send money as Bitcoin and you can receive it as whatever you want. And neither of us have to think about how that happens. It just happens in the stream of the payment. The core of it, like the internet, is the packet and the address format. And so it's a really simple format. 
I'm not going to go into the details here, but on the left is the internet packet. There's something like 15 fields. On the right is the interledger packet. There's five. Uh, so it's a very, very simple format at its core, and that's really key in order to get this type of standard adopted. Another benefit of Interledger is that is, a, is about the security mechanism that is used to make sure money doesn't get lost. So today, the way correspondent banking works, we ref, we call it optimistic execution, where each bank takes a takes the payment, passes it on to the next one, and basically hopes that it will be delivered. And if it gets lost, no one has any kind of, there's no technical guarantee that it will be delivered. So if I send a payment and it gets lost in the middle, the sender is out the money. So if anything gets messed up in that process, it's a really big problem for the sender. And this is with a relatively closed network of very repu highly reputable institutions. We obviously can't make a more open network with this type of optimistic execution. So Interledger uses a two-phase execution, and the key part of this is that the sender is guaranteed that the money cannot get lost in the middle. Won't go into more detail now, but happy to talk about that. A further kind of in the vein of parallels with the internet, if you want to send a big file over the internet, to, the internet is not optimized for big files. It's optimized for little packets, and it just does that really, really fast. So similarly, Interledger is optimized for small packet amounts, and if you want to send bigger amounts, you just send more packets. So this is an area where it starts to look very, very similar to the internet itself. We call this penny switching, kind of like packet switching. Some of the use cases that we talk about, things like micropayments for web content. Today, everything is about monetizing ads and, and sucking up data to be able to sell it on the internet. People have long talked about using micropayments instead. This is not practical if you have different micropayment networks for, di you know, I go to the New York Times and they have a different service than a different website. It'd be a pain for everyone. So you need this kind of common protocol in order to enable these types of micropayment use cases. Another weird one is being able to pay for things in unusual types of assets. So that could be things ranging from cryptocurrencies to stocks. Like, what if I wanted to walk around and say, the only form of currency that I accept is Apple stock, and I'm going to pay for lunch in little tiny increments of Apple stock. That's the kind of thing that this could enable. Um, a final one that's kind of fun, I don't know, well, uh, video's not loading, but um, one of my colleagues built a uh, thing called Laser Beer. Oh, sorry, no video of this, but I can show you later if you're interested, um, where it transmits payment information over laser, and then he built a little demo beer tap that would dispense beer as long as you're paying for it. So we talk about the idea of streaming payments, where if you make payments so efficient, that you could pay for like a milliliter of beer or a, a second of video. That's the way we think about efficiency of payments. Um, yep. Another, the other big technology that I want to mention briefly is called Codius. Codius is a hosting protocol for distributed applications that's much more flexible than the, the blockchain way of hosting we see today. Um, a key thing about this is that users stream money to the hosting providers to be able to pay for it using Interledger. Um, unlike with blockchains, the, ho the users or the uploaders can select which hosts they want to upload to. When you upload something onto a blockchain, you're always getting the same security and you're always getting massive redundancy, which for your use case may be useful or overkill. Um, applications are identified by the hash of their code. So when I upload the code, unlike with traditional cloud hosting, the host is basically saying, I promise that this is the code that's running at this endpoint, and I've not modified it at all. And if I don't trust one hosting provider, I can run it on multiple and run consensus on top of that. So it's quite a flexible model. Applications can be built with any level of fault tolerance that you want. So if you think some of the hosts might be malicious or even the developer might be malicious, this enables you to, to build applications that are Byzantine fault tolerant. Another neat part of this is uh, what we call open source services. So today it's possible to write open source code where you publish the code, but it's not possible to have a service where you say this open source code is exactly what's powering this service because I, the developer, could show you some code 
go rent a server and put completely different code on that, and you have no way of telling. So this also enables open source services. The Codius network today, this project was, was relaunched very recently. There's already over 400 different hosts in lots of different countries, and this, is, this network is just growing. A um, couple of use cases to qu quickly mention here. Don't want to take too much time, but happy to talk more about this later. Um, a content delivery network. So if there's all of these hosting providers that you can really easily pay in different countries, this would make it super easy to spin up a content delivery network. Um, another one, if you want to have a really low latency regional blockchain, you could pick a bunch of hosts that are all in the same region, spin up a private blockchain or public blockchain on top of that, and off to the races. Um, another one is because it's flexible with how many hosts you pick, if you have some kind of very small use case that doesn't need a ton of security or a ton of redundancy, you can just run it on one of these hosts, and that, that works just fine as well. So to tie it all together, I uh, mentioned some of the research opportunities we have. I took, we have a, this list of questions, and I just took a, a sampling of them, but um, one of the categories is in kind of blockchain, distributed systems, and cryptography. So some of these questions involve how, what's, what are the best ways to scale distributed ledgers? Um, things like what are the possible attacks on existing and new consensus protocols? Uh, what are the other types of consensus protocols that we can design? How anonymous are privacy-focused cryptocurrencies? How easily can they be de-anonymized? And then a, a last one that I think is quite interesting, how do you even measure decentralization? A lot of people in the blockchain space are super focused on decentralization, but as, as mentioned by Professor McCauley, a lot of the blockchains are actually under the hood very centralized because there's only a couple of, of players that effectively control it. So what are good ways of even, met? how can we even have discussions about how decentralized systems are without good ways of, of measuring decentralization? Second category is uh, economics, game theory, and market analysis. So this is everything ranging from what are the adoption curves of digital assets look like to how do you measure the utility of digital assets and things like that. Um, Couple of final ones, um, what are the policy pre challenges presented by the Internet of Value? This is something I'm particularly interested in. If you link all of these different assets together, what are the flash crashes of the future going to look like? That's something I'm personally worried about. Um, and then a final one that I'm really, really excited about, especially given MIT's long history of involvement with this subject, is more traditional networking. So. As we've been working on Interledger, we've copied so heavily from the design of the internet that a lot of the, a lot of the approaches to traditional networking basically come to bear as well. So this is everything ranging from routing algorithms and, and protocols, which the internet has a long history of, to things like, um, as I mentioned, Interledger sends little tiny packets, and so you need a protocol just like TCP does on the internet to split up and reassemble streams of, inf of information and money. So what lessons can we learn from traditional networking for that? Things like how do you preserve privacy over this type of network? Um, would people want to build virtual private networks on top of Interledger or something like Tor? And then a final really crazy one that I could talk about for a long time is interledger packets can carry money as well as data. And there's some interesting questions around what if you just had one internet protocol that could send both money and data? What kind of interesting applications would come from that? And is that even practical to imagine? So that's where I'll end. Just to give you a taste, lots of open questions and very excited to be part of this initiative. Thanks for listening.